And let's uh, go ahead and get started. This evening, we are looking at the second of um, the uh, five lectures on the Great Awakening in America. This time, we're looking at the revival of 1735. Now, again, last week, uh, we did consider what, uh, well, actually two things, what revival is and a brief history of revival. And remember, there's a couple of things we need to remember about revival that it is something that the Lord does, but he doesn't do it apart from the means. In other words, we can't just sit in the building and pray that God would uh, bring a revival. I mean, we can do that, we ought to do that, but we, can't, we have to do more than that. We also have to go out and evangelize. Now, we do need to remember something else, though, that uh, Charles Finney definitely disagreed with, and that is that we can do these things. I mean, we can we can pray and we can evangelize, but still not see what we would call a revival. The Lord must be willing to pour out of his spirit, and we're going to see more about that in this lecture. We also saw a brief history of revival to remind us of what Edward said, that revival is one of the main ways that God advances his kingdom. And if you recall from this, well, those of you who were here this morning and last week, uh, we considered that uh, that is the reason, after all, why um, we exist and why the Lord has made everything that he has made. It's solely for the work of redemption. And we are here in order to be the subjects of it as well as to help advance it. Now again, uh, tonight so we're looking at a particular revival, what we'll call the revival of 1735. So let's begin by looking at the revival itself. Toward the end of December of 1734, uh, 16 years after the last revival that took place in Northampton, and that would be under Solomon Stoddard's ministry, Jonathan Edwards' grandfather. And in the eighth year of Edwards' ministry, Edwards experienced the first revival to take place under his ministry. And he wrote in uh, basically the work that we're going to see a little bit more about called The Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God, Edwards writes. Then it was that the Spirit of God began extraordinarily to set in and wonderfully to work among us. And there were very suddenly, one after another, five or six persons who were to all appearances savingly converted. Now, that may not seem like a great deal to us, but to the Puritan mind, that was certainly uh, a lot to see at one time, especially when we consider as we read on about the number of people who are going to be converted Edwards, uh, the town of Northampton, I think all the people there attended uh, Edwards Church. It was the only church in the area. I think amounted to about 200 families, and I think it was around seven or 800 people. Uh, this number of conversions, we had to consider that these people had actually been under the ministry of Solomon Stoddard, most of them from their childhood, and uh, perhaps a number of them already believed themselves to be converted. But uh, again, with the revival coming, they're going to find that a number of them weren't actually converted at all. Edwards again writes, a great and earnest concern about the great things of religion and the eternal worlds became universal in all parts of the town and among persons of all degrees and all ages. All other talk but about spiritual and eternal things was soon thrown by. All the conversation in all companies and upon all occasions was upon these things only unless so much as was necessary for people carrying on their ordinary secular business. The minds of people were wonderfully taken off from the world. It was treated amongst us as a thing of very little consequence. When once the Spirit of God began to be so wonderfully poured out in a general way through the town, people had soon done with their old quarrels, backbitings, and intermeddling with other men's matters. The tavern was soon left empty, and persons kept very much at home. None went abroad unless on necessary business or on some religious account, and every day seemed in many respects like a Sabbath day. The place of resort was now altered. It was no longer the tavern, but the minister's house that was thronged far more than ever the tavern had been accustomed or wont to be. Our public assemblies were then beautiful, Congregation was alive in God's service. Everyone earnestly intent on the public worship, every hearer eager to drink in the words of the minister as they came from his mouth. 
the assembly in general were from time to time in tears while the word was preached, some weeping with sorrow and distress, others with joy and love, others with pity and concern for the souls of their neighbors. Our public praises were then greatly enlivened. God was then served in our psalmody, in some measure in the beauty of holiness. It has been observable that there has been scarce any part of divine worship wherein good men amongst us have had grace so drawn forth and their hearts so lifted up in the ways of God as in singing his praises. Persons after their conversion often speak of religious things as seeming new to them, that preaching is a new thing, that it seems to them they never heard preaching before, that the Bible is a new book. They find their new chapters, new psalms, new histories because they see them in a new light. Here was a remarkable instance of an aged woman of above 70 years who had spent most of her days under Mr. Stoddard's powerful ministry. Reading in the New Testament concerning Christ's sufferings for sinners, she seemed astonished at what she read as what was real and very wonderful but quite new to her. At first, before she had time to turn her thoughts, she wondered within herself that she had never heard of it before, but then immediately recollected herself and thought she had often heard of it and read it, but never till now saw it as real. She then cast in her mind how wonderful this was that the Son of God should undergo such things for sinners, and how she had spent her time in ungratefully sinning against so good a God and such a Savior, though she was a person apparently of a very blameless and inoffensive life. And she was so overcome by those considerations that her nature was ready to fail under them. Those who were about her and knew not what was the matter were surprised and thought she was dying. Now we do uh, read that the revival reached its peak. It started in December of 1734 and reached its peak in March and April of 1735. At that time, Edwards was seeing conversions taking place at the rate, he says, at least of four persons in a day or near 30 in a week take one with another for four or six weeks together, which again is remarkable considering there are only 200 families in the town. He writes, we have up here, I received in our communion about 100 before our sacrament. I took in near 60 before the next sacrament day whose appearance when they presented themselves together to make an open, explicit profession of Christianity, were affecting to the congregation. Another 60 were added at the next communion. And bear in mind, they weren't having weekly communion as we have, which uh, <laughs> may be what was happening under the Great Awakening, but um, they had communion about every eight weeks, and every eight weeks they said they were taking in about 60, 60 new uh, congregants who were making profession of faith. Now, he concluded with regard to how many might have been saved. He says, I am far from pretending to be able to determine how many have lately been the subjects of such mercy. But if I may be allowed to declare anything that appears to be probable in a thing of this nature, I hope that more than 300 souls were savingly brought home to Christ in this town in the space of half a year, and about the same number of males as females. I hope that by far the greater part of persons in this town above 16 years of age are such as have the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. There are very few houses in the whole town into which salvation has not lately come in one or more instances. So again, this, this is the, the account of the revival from uh, Edward's um, own uh, experience. Now, news of the revival begins to spread, and this brings about the writing of his account of this, of this revival called A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God. Now, widespread revivals were actually unknown in these times, so others were having a hard time believing that such things were even possible. When uh, Benjamin Coleman, that's the uh, gentleman up here, a senior minister in Boston, wrote to Edwards to find out more about the revival, Edwards replied in a short letter on May the 30th, 1735. After describing what had taken place, Edwards wrote, 
the extraordinariness of the thing has been, I believe, one principal cause that people abroad have suspected it. I have given you a particular account of this affair which Satan has so much misrepresented in the country. Now, Coleman was so impressed uh, by the account that Edwards had written to him that he passed on part of the letter to John Geis and Isaac Watts. Um, again, this is Coleman, Geis, and Watts. Uh, Geis and Watts were two nonconformist um, ministers in, uh, in England. And again, nonconformist simply means they weren't a part of the Church of England, evangelicals, and certainly reformed. Let's see. Um, when Watts shared the letter with his congregation, they wanted to know more about it. And they wanted that which was known about the revival to be put into print. So Geis wrote to Coleman, who then wrote to Edward's uncle, William Williams. And uh, because interest in the revival had spread to more than one country, Coleman wanted the endeavor to be endorsed by one of the country's or county's senior ministers. So Williams, that's why he wrote to Williams. Williams confirmed the event and passed on the request from London to his nephew at Northampton. Edwards then wrote a much fuller letter to Coleman that was dated November the 6th, 1736. And it was in the second letter that he gave uh, the number of probable conversions, as we saw uh, just a few moments ago, about 300, along with two additional examples, that of Abigail Hutchison and Phoebe Bartlett. And the reason why he chose these two individuals was because one of them was advanced in age, I think over 70 years of age, Abigail Hutchison, and her life was transformed by the revival. And Phoebe Bartlett, who, if we, um, if we have time, and I think we will, was only four years old when she was converted. And I think you'll see as I read the account Edwards gives of her conversion and subsequent life uh, that many of the things she does, I think, would put us all to shame as far as her zeal uh, for the Lord. Now, Edwards uh, gave Coleman this letter and gave Coleman also the freedom to use the letter as he saw fit. So Coleman took what would later amount to about a 132-page book and reduced it to an 18-page abridgment and included it as an appendix to a book of sermons by Williams that he was supervising at that time through a Boston printer. The book entitled The Duty and Interest of a People came out in December of 1736. And that appendix in the book was really the first printed news of the revival. Coleman wrote at its conclusion, if the taste here given of Mr. Edwards, uh, his excellent letter, excite in persons of piety a desire to have the whole of it published, it is hereby notified that subscriptions for that end will be taken. Now, Watson Geis received the abridgment, the 18-page abridgment, in February of 1737, and immediately they wanted to see the whole in print. They wrote, quote, So strange and surprising a work of God that we have not heard anything like it since the Reformation should be published and left upon record. So they sent their request to Coleman along with five pounds to contribute to its printing in Boston. Now, Coleman decided not to go ahead with the printing probably because he was waiting for more people to subscribe. He had to raise the money before he could have it printed. And because he was too busy to transcribe and edit it uh, at that time. But because those in London were eager to see it, he sent the original letter that he had received from Edwards to Watson Geis, who would be able to publish this work for a much wider audience than those in New England. So this is how the letter came to be published in a book in the fall of 1737, Watts and Geis wrote the preface and entitled the work, A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God in the Conversion of Many Hundred Souls in Northampton and the Neighboring Towns and Villages of New Hampshire in New England. In those days, you know, the titles of books were considerably longer. It was also an advertisement or a summary of what the book was about. Now in it, they write this. This is very important. Please pay attention to what they have to say because this is the importance of revivals. He says, certainly it becomes us who profess the religion of Christ to take notice of such astonishing exercises of his power and mercy and give him the glory which is due 
when he begins to accomplish any of his promises concerning the latter days. And it gives us further encouragement to pray and wait and hope for the like display of his power in the midst of us. The hand of our God is not shortened that it cannot save. But we have reason to fear that our iniquities, our coldness in religion, and the general carnality of our spirits have raised the wall of separation between God and us. And we may add the pride and perverse humor of infidelity, degeneracy, and apostasy from the Christian faith, which have of late years broken out amongst us, seem to have provoked the spirit of Christ to absent himself much from our nation. Return, O Lord, and visit your churches and revive your own work in the midst of us. We are taught also by this happy event how easy it will be for our blessed Lord to make a full accomplishment of all his predictions concerning his kingdom and to spread his dominion from sea to sea through all the nations of the earth. We see how easy it is for him with one turn of his hand, with one word of his mouth, to awaken whole countries of stupid and sleeping sinners and kindle divine life in their souls. The heavenly influence shall run from door to door, filling the hearts and lips of every inhabitant with importunate inquiries. What shall we do to be saved? And how shall we escape the wrath to come? And the name of Christ our Savior shall diffuse itself like a rich and vital perfume to multitudes that were ready to sink and perish under the painful sense of their own guilt and danger. Salvation shall spread through all the tribes and ranks of mankind as the lightning from heaven in a few moments would communicate a living flame through 10,000 lamps and torches placed in a proper situation and neighborhood. Thus a nation shall be born in a day when our Redeemer please. And his faithful and obedient subjects shall become as numerous as the spires of grass in a meadow newly mown and refreshed with the showers of heaven. Now it is interesting that Watts and Geis also mentioned that there were a few things that they had to edit from the letter that Edwards wrote that mainly had to do with the affections, the, the emotions that those who were converted were experiencing and there was a reason for that. It was so it would be more acceptable to the English audience. Said uh, Ian Murray, who writes an excellent biography on the life of Jonathan Edwards, writes this. The prevailing mood, even in many churches, was against the need or expectation of any emotion in those professing to be Christians. Watts and Geis mourned that fact and believed that things would change in any God-given revival. This was clearly their main concern in promoting the publication of Edwards. May a plentiful effusion of the blessed spirit also descend on the British Isles and all their American plantations to renew the face of religion there. That's the reason why the account was published. It was in order to uh, encourage the work of revival and that God's people would begin to seek it. And by reading it, they would be reproved by the things they see going on when the work of the Spirit of God is powerful among a people. As a matter of fact, I hope we're already getting a sense of something like that as we're going through comparing what our day-to-day -day life is like compared to what it is for them. Now, with regard to the influence of the faithful narrative, it was possibly the most significant book uh, written before the Great Awakening, both in England and New England. Between 1737 and 1739, it went through three editions and 20 printings. In England, it gained the attention of that generation of men who were about to be used by the Lord to shake the nation. John Wesley wrote in his journal for October the 9th, 1738, I set out for Oxford. In walking, I read the truly surprising narrative of the conversions lately wrought in and about the town of Northampton in New England. Surely this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, Northampton wasn't the only place revivals were taking place, and uh, nor was it just in New England. There were no reports to this point, at least, of revivals in, in Britain, but yet there were other places outside of New England that had experienced the hand of God. By the fall of 1735, 
Edwards was exhausted because of all the additional uh, labor he put in from uh, ministering to those who were being converted. Of course, it would be a very uh, pleasant uh, labor, but even pleasant labor can eventually wear you out. Believing that a lengthy horseback ride would restore his health, he made the long journey down to New York, which was about 163 miles. Uh, today, that might only take a few hours by car, but you can imagine how long that would take by horseback. Uh, he went down to see some acquaintances that he had made when he was in New York from 1722 to 23, uh, serving as a pastor of a Presbyterian congregation. It was at this time that he became acquainted with the tenants. Now, the tenants were just uh, beginning to become known within New England through their writings. Um, by the way, I, we, there aren't pictures that exist of all the tenants. Uh, this, this is William Tennant Sr., his son, Gilbert Tennant, and William Tennant Jr. He also had a son, John Tennant. We don't have a picture of him. And this uh, structure right here is a picture of um, basically a seminary that was called the Log College, where uh, William Tennant Sr. basically trained not only his sons to be ministers, but he trained a whole group of men that had a tremendous impact uh, upon, um, well, upon the, the colonies, but especially in... Uh, New England and New York area. Now, Gilbert Tennant had just published a sermon called Solemn Warning to the Secure World, and John Tennant, The Nature of Regeneration, opened. Again, the writings by which they became known. William Tennant Sr., a Presbyterian pastor and teacher at his log college on the Shemini Creek, 20 miles north of Philadelphia, had become a strong spokesman for revitalized Christianity. Uh, through his four sons, excuse me, he had four sons. I've only got pictures of two of them up here. Gilbert, William, John, and Charles, as well as some of his pupils, his influence increased. Gilbert was pastor at New Brunswick, New Jersey, and John in Freehold. When John died in 1732, he was succeeded by his elder brother, uh, William Tennant, Jr. Now, William was 30 years old when Edwards met him in 1735. And it was likely the first time that Edwards heard about the revivals that were taking place outside of New England from him. All three of the Tennant brothers, apparently uh, John uh, was gone before that time, had witnessed awakenings in local congregations a few years before the revival took place in Northampton. So the point here is that this revival of 1735 took place not only in New England, but also outside New England in various places. Now, the question arises, uh, what is it that the Lord used to bring about the revivals? And what was the condition of the, the churches and of society prior to that time? Well, apparently, the uh, state of the church was deplorable. Again, Ian Murray writes this. Prior to the 1730s, the state of professing Christians in most parts of the English-speaking world appeared reminiscent of the wise and foolish virgins. They all slumbered and slept. There was a small difference between the church and the world. Almost any degree of religious interest or of adherence to the forms of religion was considered enough to justify a person's Christian profession. And all who grew up in the church were commonly treated as belonging to Christ irrespective of evidence to the contrary. Let me just ask you as I read through this, does this sound like a commentary on today? Commenting on the state of affairs among the Presbyterian churches of the Middle Colonies, Archibald Alexander writes that there was soundness in the faith, but as to the, as, excuse me, but as to the vital power of godliness, there is reason to believe that it was little known or spoken of. The habit of the preachers was to address their people as though they were all pious and only needed instruction and confirmation. It was not a common thing to proclaim the terrors of a violated law and to insist on the absolute necessity of regeneration. This assessment would have been accepted by all the preachers of whom we are now speaking. They judged that the fundamental need of their contemporaries was to understand the meaning of being a true Christian. And further, they were convinced that the absence of this understanding was to be attributed chiefly to a defective view of sin. 
it had become assumed that men could be savingly related to Christ without any prior conviction about the sin, which made their salvation necessary. Men were treated as saved who never knew they were lost. In New England, spiritual conditions were probably better than in other parts, yet even there Solomon's daughter could write, multitudes of souls perish through the ignorance of those that should guide them in the way to heaven. Men are nourished up with vain hopes of being in a state of salvation before they have got half the way to Christ. It has sometimes been assumed that the preaching of the 18th century leaders in the revivals of North America was simply continuing a well-established tradition. That, however, is not the case. The commonly accepted preaching was not calculated to break through the prevailing formalism and indifference. And the preaching which did bring men to a sense of need and humiliation before God was of a very different order. So again, what uh, Murray is saying here is that um, it wasn't just business as usual. And actually, that's uh, somewhat of a revelation to me. I was thinking that, well, I know for Edwards, for the most part, I'm sure he was preaching the truth, and I'm sure that Solomon Stoddard was as well for the most part. But the fact is, their preaching did take a turn that actually brought the awakening, the awakening about. And um, this is going to be very important because this is what essentially we need to do if we're going to help other people find Christ. Again, they have to know their need of Christ before they're ever going to reach out and trust him. So what kind of preaching was necessary in order to awaken people and bring them to Christ? And I want you to note here uh, especially in light of what we saw last week, the difference between what Murray is going to say uh, was the focus of their preaching and what uh, Charles Finney believed. And again, uh, Murray representing uh, the, uh, the Reformed uh, understanding of Scripture and uh, Finney representing what we might call and what we did call last week more of a uh, Pelagian. So I suppose you would say Murray and those he's writing about were of an Augustinian persuasion. They believe that salvation was solely in the hands of God. It's something that he bestows. It's not something that man does. Whereas Finney believed that every man had the ability to believe. We just had to give him the proper motivation in order to do it. Listen to what uh, Murray writes. In the preaching which Edwards, the tenants, and others were recovering in the 1730s, there was much more than a new degree of earnestness. Their understanding of what was required of a preacher was different. As Reformed pastors, they knew the purpose of preaching was not to induce the regeneration of their hearers, and that would, of course, be speaking of Finney, who lived after these folks. The giving of new life to the spiritually dead is solely the act of the Spirit of God. None can enter the kingdom of God without first being born from above. But they also believed that it was God's usual way and manner in bestowing grace to work in sinners prior to their regeneration or new birth in order to reveal uh, their false security. Let me back up. Okay, it was God's usual way to work in them to reveal their false security and to bring them to conscious emptiness and need. While they did not deny that faith may be given to infants or even to some in older years without any prior period of conviction, they understood the Bible to teach that as a general rule. Conviction precedes conversion. Such conviction in their view is not a qualification which entitles a sinner to believe, nor can it savingly separate a man from sin but it brings those who are destined for salvation to the acknowledgement of their need of mercy. Edwards and his brethren consequently denied that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ was the one message to be addressed to the unconverted. Certainly that command presents the one term of salvation and as such it is to be made known to all but something else is first needed to make the command relevant. By the way, uh, you'll remember that that command, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, was given to the Philippian jailer, who at that point was trembling in his boots and ready to kill himself because of uh, the fact he thought all of his prisoners had escaped. So there was already worked within him a concern for his soul. Now what 
Murray is saying is that that concern has to be there before the offer is made, and he'll explain a little bit more why. Now, Robert Bolton writes this, a man must feel himself in misery before he will go about to find a remedy, be sick before he will seek a physician, be in prison before he will seek for a pardon. A sinner must be weary of his former wicked ways before he will have recourse to Jesus Christ for refreshing. He must be sensible of his spiritual poverty, beggary, and slavery under the devil before he thirsts kindly for heavenly righteousness and willingly takes up Christ's sweet and easy yoke. He must be cast down, confounded, condemned, a castaway, and lost in himself before he will look about for a savior. And again, an illustration that I think is helpful and, and I use often is um, a man won't see his need for a lifesaver, you know, the, those lifesavers that are on boats, unless he's drowning. If you throw a lifesaver to someone who's on land, they're going to look at you like, what's wrong with you? But if they're drowning in the ocean, you throw them the lifesaver, they'll reach out for it and, and uh, you know, try to get it because their life depends on it. Well, the lifesaver is like the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone doesn't see their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're never really going to reach out for him. That's why the work of conviction needs to take place. Now, how can a person be brought to see their need? Edwards tells us that they're never going to see it by themselves because sin blinds them to that reality and by nature they are secure, what the Puritans called carnal security. Edwards writes, they do not realize that God sees them when they commit sin and will call them to an account for it. They are stupidly senseless to the importance of eternal things. The Holy Spirit has to apply the truth to their consciences in order to awaken them. And this is what he typically does through the preaching of the word and more specifically the law of God. Solomon Stoddard, again, Edward's grandfather, writes this in his Guide to Christ. It is the duty of ministers to preach such things to sinners as are proper to work this preparation. David Dixon, another Puritan, tells us that there is a voluntary examination that Christians are often engaged in. I mean, Christians want to know what their sins are. And they want God to reveal them all so that they can repent of those things and turn away from them for that reason, J.I. Packer once said that Christians will not mind having their lives examined all the way to the ground because they want to be rid of their sins. But it's quite a different thing when it comes to the unconverted. For them, they need a forced examination and a wakening up of the conscience, whether the sinner wants it or not. This is basically what David Dixon is saying is the duty of the minister to do. And I would, you know, back in those days, one thing we also need to bear in mind is that the ministers believed that the work was virtually entirely in their hands and that the people of God didn't really have much work to do, but it had to do with an interpretation of Ephesians chapter 4 and whether or not the Lord gave ministers, uh, teachers and pastors and teachers, uh, as well as the, the apostles and prophets and evangelists and so forth, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ and so forth, did they give them to do all the work, building up the body of Christ and all the evangelism, or did, they, did the Lord give them to build up the body of Christ that they might also do that work? The Puritans tended to believe it was mainly the work of the minister, which is why we see a lot of quotes at that end. But let's not forget that we all have some responsibility in this area to seek to uh, bring Christ to others. And again, uh, the idea here is that they're not necessarily going to examine themselves, so we need to seek to help them do it. Now, he says this is what Paul did. Let me see. Did I, uh... Oh, okay, right here. This is what Paul did when he witnessed before Felix. The pastor's part here is not only to exhort men to a voluntary examination of themselves, that would be the, the Christian. But also by the sword of the Spirit, he must labor to open the, the apostoms, which means the festering sores of proud sinners. 
discovering unto them as occasion serves their wickedness and denouncing the wrath of God against them, if possibly the Lord shall give them repentance as he did to the hearers of Peter. By the way, that was a quote from, again, David Dixon. Uh, that's a picture of him here who was also a Puritan. Uh, the idea being, again, that um, we need to try to help them see their danger. Again, it's, it's very common today to approach someone and say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's the, uh, you know, the four spiritual laws, basically. And uh, that makes people feel pretty good. But the problem is it doesn't show them their need. It doesn't show them that they're actually an enemy of God and under his wrath and will perish unless they repent. Uh, they need to be warned and they need to be, well, urged, encouraged, exhorted uh, to seek after Jesus Christ, whom God offers as a savior to all men. And if they will turn from their sins and trust in him, then they will be saved. Oftentimes our approach makes them feel already loved by God and they don't really sense their need. As uh, one time John Gerstner said, for those that um, drive around with the bumper sticker on that says, smile, God loves you. He says, I can just imagine, uh, and, and got to take this into account, the fact that John Gerstner is from another generation. He says, I can just see a mafia hitman having made his hit, having killed someone, and then perhaps his conscience troubling him slightly, driving down the street and seeing that bumper sticker, smile, God loves you. It's not going to have the effect. It's not going to have what that person needs to hear. The fact is that he is an enemy of God, and God is going to call him to account unless he repents and turns to the Savior. Of course, that is the kind of preaching that is necessary to awaken sinners. Now, Edwards saw that though men are fallen, they still have a conscience, a conscience that tells them the difference between right and wrong, and a conscience that tells them that there is judgment coming for their crimes. And they need to be brought to a point where their consciences are staring them in the face. Otherwise, they will not see their need of a savior and of his sacrifice. Again, Robert Bolton writes this, pressing upon men's consciences with a jealous, discreet powerfulness, their special principle flesh, or excuse me, fresh bleeding sins is a notable means to break the hearts and bring them to remorse. Now again, the question is, how can this be done? The answer is through the law. Paul writes, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. The law is that which brings men face to face with God's holiness and shows them why they should fear him so that so that, Paul writes, every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. When the law does its work, when it creates a deep awareness of sin and the need of a savior, when that happens in several people at one time, that is revival. Now, Edwards, again, commenting on the revival of 1735, writes this, the only thing in their view, and that is the people in his town, the only thing in their view was to get the kingdom of heaven. And everyone appeared pressing into it. The engagedness of their hearts and this great concern could not be hid. It appeared in their very countenances. It then was a dreadful thing amongst, amongst us to lie out of Christ in danger every day of dropping into hell. And what persons' minds were intent upon was to escape for their lives and to fly from the wrath to come. The town seemed to be full of the presence of God. It never was so full of love nor of joy and yet so full of distress as it was then. Ian Murray writes, possibly the greatest practical lesson from the 1735 revival for the pulpit of our day is that when ministers have to deal with indifference and unconcern, they will simply beat the air unless they begin where the Holy Spirit begins. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. 
Now again, we, we should pause here for a moment and uh, just consider what we might learn from this. That again, a revival is when there is general concern in a community uh, for their well-being. They're awakened to the fact that, that uh, they're under God's wrath, they're in danger of hell, and they need to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. They also recognize, by the way, that salvation is in the Lord's hands, which is why they look to him uh, for that mercy. But the way that they actually brought them to this point was not through the preaching of a message, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, at least until it was preceded by messages from the law of God as to why men and women, children needed a savior. It's because they had broken the law of God. And that is the reason why God gives the law. It is meant to be a tutor to lead us to the Lord Jesus Christ by showing us our sins and showing us what we deserve for our sins. It drives us to the Savior. And again, unless we understand that, unless we see it, we're not actually going to reach out for a Savior. So if we are to be a means of bringing other people to Christ, at some point we do need to make them aware of their sins. We do need to make them aware of the law of God. We need not only to show them the consequences of their sins, but in some way to help them uh, sense how serious that is. But again, realizing that only the Spirit of God can really bring that truth home. Uh, this awakening was, again, not something that these men did in and of themselves. They're not meaning to say that this is all it took, was just making people aware of their sins. I mean, we might do that all day long, and people may not respond in a positive way at all. It is, and that's the point I'm, yeah. I'm making. Yes, the Spirit of God needs to bring it home. So that's why we need not only to evangelize and in that evangelism bring the law of God, but we need to pray. Sometimes people get kind of stuck in, in, in the stage of conviction and not go to the next step. Or is that way that the, how we can help people? Or what? Well, it is, it is possible that um, people can... Uh, reach a stage of conviction and that can be sustained for a long period of time and during that time people can seek the Lord and yet not seem to find him. Uh, that can happen but typically it doesn't happen in today's world, with, in today's churches. If anybody has any concern, as Murray said a little bit early, they're told that they are Christians already or they're told to pray this prayer and then if they pray this prayer they're automatically going to become Christians. But that isn't really the case. Uh, Stoddard was saying in his day that people were uh, being, again, relieved of their concern before they had made it even halfway to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one thing we do have to uh, be wary of. Now, I wanted to um, also just share what the Lord did. I think I mentioned to you before that uh, Edwards picked two people in particular in Northampton that he saw uh, a remarkable work of the Spirit of God in. Uh, one of them was in Abigail Hutchinson, and the other one was in Phoebe Bartlett. And I thought it might be uh, at least interesting uh, to uh, see what the Lord did in the life of Phoebe Bartlett. I think we have time to go through. This is going to take a little, a little while. Let's see, for some reason, this thing isn't advancing. The, did I take too long and it shut down? How do I turn it back on? Sorry about that. Computers are wonderful, but <laughs> sometimes. <clears throat> well, while we're waiting for this to be rectified, were there any other questions or comments before we move on to uh, the life of Phoebe Bartlett? It was around this time that that took place that those that were in favor of the revival and those that were not in favor of it actually... Why were they not in favor of revival? Did they feel it was some sort of a danger and over-emotion or what was it? 
I think that they had reduced Christianity more, I think you're right in that, that they had reduced Christianity more to a, a set of beliefs to be believed. It was, it was sort of an abstract. Um, as a matter of fact, there are some today, and I've run into them, who would say that Christianity is not a matter of the heart at all. It's a matter of just right belief. And if I believe the right things, I'm a Christian. Jonathan Edwards would say, you do need to believe the right things regarding God and regarding Christ and salvation and so forth, but if you don't love him, you're not a Christian. Now, Ken, there was perhaps other things going on, um, some types of religious experiences that some might question as whether that was from God or not. We're actually going to look a little bit of that in the uh, fourth week when we consider the, the marks of the Spirit of God and how Edwards wrote his religious affections to uh, point out uh, what the Spirit of God does when he's truly at work. And the reason why he did that was because of the people who were criticizing the revival, saying that it was a work of the enemy. With regard to the halfway covenant, that was something that Solomon Stoddard had, had begun, Jonathan Edwards' grandfather. Uh, what happened was the Puritans had raised uh, the bar for salvation so high that uh, most people couldn't make it under or over the bar, I guess you might say. They, they didn't measure up. And so you had a number of people, uh, children who had been baptized and who were in the churches growing up and, and they were getting married and they were having children. And uh, the fact is that uh, they didn't, um, um, actually, okay, they didn't um, profess faith in Christ because they didn't believe themselves to be Christians. But yet the question arose, what should we do with their children? You know, they're baptized and they're members of the church. They haven't yet been confirmed, but... Um, they haven't left the church. What do we do with their children? Well, the halfway covenant was let's baptize their children too and include them in the church. And I did make one mistake. Stoddard was not the one who originated that. He's the one who originated giving them the other sacrament of the Lord's Supper. You know, well, I, I couldn't... In, I couldn't rehearse exactly what their qualifications were, but I do know this, that they believed that every, everyone who was truly converted had to go through a certain series of steps. And it had to be pretty much in this order. And if you couldn't say that you had actually gone through these steps, then you really couldn't say that you were a Christian. And Edwards spoke against that as well. He said, I never went through these steps, and, and at least not in this order. And yet, I know I'm a true believer. So that, that had something to do with it. All right, well, let's move on uh, quickly to Phoebe Bartlett. And there really are no existing pictures of her, but uh, and I'm not, <laughs> anyway, when I looked it up online, I came up with these two pictures. Uh, Phoebe Bartlett was actually only four years old. And I think when you, can, when you understand that, you're going to be quite shocked. Oops, something else happened here. What do I have to hit to get rid of the, this dialogue? Too many buttons. Okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll advance to that one. Okay. Anyway, let's look at Phoebe Bartlett again from Faithful Narrative, The Surprising Work of God, which we've already seen its publication, how it came about. This account comes from Phoebe's parents, but Edwards is the one who wrote it down and relates it to us. Now, he gives to us in here several indications that she was genuinely converted. Again, we're talking here about a four-year-old child. And one interesting note by an editor of the Banner of Truth, excuse me, it wasn't the Banner of Truth editor, but the edition that the Banner of Truth put into print, and I believe that work is still in print. Uh, the editor makes a comment that, and he writes this, that she was still living in March of 1789. And let's see if she's born in 1731. That makes her, what, about, 50, uh, about 58 years old. And she was still living in March of 1789 and maintained the character of a true convert. So that uh, this was not something that uh, just happened when she was four years old, but something she maintained throughout her life. And as we look at this account of what the Lord did for her in the 1735 revival, let, let's just bear in mind that though we may not necessarily have the, the experiences that she had, to the degree that she had them. But we certainly, if we are true believers, ought to have something of each of these things in our lives. And we certainly should pray that the Lord would make them at least as strong, if not stronger, than they were in her. 
Okay, so let's read what Edwards has to say about Phoebe Bartlett. She was born in March of 1731. About the latter end of April or beginning of May 1735, she was greatly affected by the talk of her brother, who had been hopefully converted a little before at about 11 years of age, and then seriously talked to her about the great things of religion. Her parents did not know of it at that time and were not um, wont or... Um, Let's see again, the, the word is, they weren't used or accustomed. Uh, in the counsels they gave to their children, particularly to direct themselves to her being so young, and as they supposed, not capable of understanding. By the way, <laughs> this is also going to be an encouragement to us to teach our children, no matter what their age, to put their trust in the Savior. They didn't think she was capable. Well, we'll see whether she was or not. But after her brother had talked to her, they observed her very earnestly listened to the advice they gave to the other children. And she was observed very constantly to retire several times in a day, as was concluded for secret prayer. She grew more and more engaged in religion, was more frequent in her closet, till at last she was accustomed to visit it five or six times a day, and was so engaged in it that nothing would at any time divert her from her stated closet exercises, her mother often observed and watched her when such things occurs as she thought most likely to divert her, either by putting it out of her thoughts or otherwise engaging her inclinations, but never could observe her to fail. In other words, the TV didn't take her away. <laughs> didn't have it in those days. But She mentioned some very remarkable instances. She once of her own accord spoke of her unsuccessfulness in that she could not find God or to that purpose. But on Thursday, the last day of July, about the middle of the day, the child being in the closet where she used to retire, her mother heard her speaking aloud, which was unusual and never had been observed before. And her voice seemed to be as of one exceedingly importunate and engaged. But her mother could distinctly hear only these words spoken in a childish manner, but with extraordinary earnestness and out of distress of soul, Pray, blessed Lord, give me salvation. I pray, beg, pardon all my sins. When the child had done prayer, she came out of the closet, sat down by her mother and cried out aloud. Her mother very earnestly asked her several times what the matter was before she would make any answer, but she continued crying and writhing her body to and fro like one in anguish of spirit. Her mother then asked her whether she was afraid that God would not give her salvation. She then answered, yes, I am afraid I shall go to hell. Her mother then endeavored to quiet her and told her that she would not have her cry. She must be a good girl and pray every day. And she hoped God would give her salvation, but this did not quiet her at all. She continued thus earnestly crying and taking on for some time till at length she suddenly ceased crying and began to smile and presently said with a smiling countenance, Mother, the kingdom of heaven has come to me. Her mother was surprised at the sudden alteration and at the speech and knew not what to make of it, but at first said nothing to her. The child presently spoke again and said, there is another come to me and there is another, there is three. And being asked what she meant, she answered, one is thy will be done and there is another, enjoy him forever. By which it seems that when the child said there is three come to me, she meant three passages of her catechism that came to her mind. After the child had said this, she retired again into her closet and her mother went over to her brother's who was next neighbor. And when she came back, the child being come out of the closet meets her mother with this cheerful speech. I can find God now, referring to what she had before complained of that she could not find God. Then the child spoke again and said, I love God. Her mother asked her how well she loved God, whether she loved God better than her father and mother. She said, yes. Then she asked her whether she loved God better than her little sister, Rachel. She answered, yes, better than anything. Her mother asked her whether she was afraid of going to hell, and if that had made her cry, she answered, yes, it, I was, but now I shan't. Her mother asked her whether she thought that God had given her salvation. She answered, yes. Her mother asked her when. She answered, today. She appeared all that afternoon exceedingly cheerful and joyful. That evening as she lay abed, she called one of her little cousins to her who was present in the room 
as having something to say to him. And when he came, she told him that heaven was better than earth. The next day, her mother asked her what God made her for. She answered to serve him and added, everybody should serve God and get an interest in Christ. Again, bear in mind, four-year-old. <laughs> the same day, the elder children, when they came back from school, seemed much affected with the extraordinary change that seemed to be in Phoebe, or be made in Phoebe. And her sister Abigail standing by, her mother took occasion to counsel her now to improve her time, to prepare for another world, on which Phoebe burst out in tears and cried out, poor Nabby. Her mother told her she would not have, or she would not have to cry. She hoped that God would give Nabby salvation, but that did not quiet her. She continued earnestly crying for some time. When she had in a measure ceased her sister Eunice being by her, she burst out again and cried, poor Eunice, and cried exceedingly. And when she had almost done, she went into another room and there looked upon her sister Naomi and burst out again crying, poor Amy. Her mother was greatly affected at such a behavior in a child and knew not what to say to her. One of the neighbors coming in a little while after asked her what she had cried for. She seemed at first backward to tell the reason. Her mother told her she might tell that person, upon which she said she cried because she was afraid they would go to hell. At night, a certain minister who was occasionally in the town was at the house and talked of her with, of religious things. After he was gone, she sat leaning on the table with tears running from her eyes and being asked what made her cry, she said, I was thinking about God. From this time, there appeared a very remarkable, abiding change in the child. She has been very strict upon the Sabbath and seems to long for the Sabbath day before it comes and will often in the week time be inquiring how long it is to the Sabbath day and must have the days between particularly counted over before she will be contented. She seems to love God's house and is very eager to go there. Her mother once asked her why she had such a mind to go, whether it was not to see fine folks, maybe to see her friends. She said, no, it was to hear Mr. Edwards preach. When she is in the place of worship, she is very far from spending her time there as, a ch as children at her age usually do, but appears with an attention that is very extraordinary for such a child. She also appears very desirous at all opportunities to go to private religious meetings and is very still and attentive at home during prayer and has appeared affected in time of family prayer. She seems to delight much in hearing religious conversation. When I once was there with some strangers, Edwards, this is Edward speaking, when I once was there with some strangers and talked to her something of religion, she seemed more than ordinarily attentive. And when we were gone, she looked out very wistfully after us and said, I wish they would come again. Her mother asked her why. Uh, says she, I love to hear him talk. She seems to have very much the fear of God before her eyes and an extraordinary dread of sinning against him, of which her mother mentioned the following remarkable instance. Sometime in August the last year, she went with some bigger children to get some plums in a neighbor's lot, knowing nothing of any harm in what she did. When she brought some of the plums into the house, her mother mildly reproved her and told her that she must not get plums without leave because it was sin. God had commanded her not to steal. The child seemed greatly surprised and burst out in tears and cried out, I won't have these plums. And turning to her sister Eunice, very earnestly said to her, why did you ask me to go to that plum tree? I should not have gone if you had not asked me. The other children did not seem to be much affected or concerned, but there was no pacifying Phoebe. Her mother told her she might go and ask leave and then it would not be sin for her to eat them and sent one of the children to that end. And when she returned, her mother told her that the owner had given leave. Now she might eat them and it would not be stealing. This stilled her a little while, but presently she broke out again into an exceeding fit of crying. Her mother asked her what made her cry again. Why she cried now, why she cried now since they had asked leave. What it was that troubled her now and asked her several times very earnestly before she made any answer, but at last said, it was because, because it was sin. 
She continued a considerable time crying and said she would not go again if Eunice asked her a hundred times. And she retained her aversion to that fruit for a considerable time under the remembrance of her former sin. She sometimes appeared greatly affected and delighted with texts of scripture that came to her mind, particularly about the beginning of November. That text came to her mind, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. She spoke of it to those of the family with a great appearance of joy, a smiling countenance, and elevation of voice. Afterwards, she went into another room where her mother overheard her talking very earnestly to the children about it, and particularly heard her say to them three or four times over with an air of exceeding joy and admiration why it is to sup with God. She has often manifested a great concern for the good of others' souls and has been accustomed many times affectionately to counsel other children. Once about the latter end of September, the last year, when she and some of others of the children were in a room by themselves husking Indian corn, the child, after a while, came out and sat by the fire. Her mother took notice that she appeared with a more than ordinary serious and pensive countenance, but at last she broke silence and said, I have been talking to Nabby. And Eunice, her mother asked her what she had said to them. Why, said she, I told them they must pray and prepare to die. <laughs> that they had but a little while to live in this world and they must always be ready or be always ready. When Abby came out, her mother asked her whether she had said that to them. Yes, said she. She said that and a great deal more. At other times, the child took opportunities to talk to the other children about the great concern of their souls so as much to affect them. She has discovered an uncommon degree of the spirit of charity, particularly on the following occasion. A poor man that lives in the woods had lately lost a cow that the family much depended on. And being at the house, he was relating his misfortune and telling of the straits and difficulties they were reduced to by it. She took much notice of it and it wrought exceedingly on her compassion. After she had attentively heard him a while, she went away to her father, who was in the shop, and entreated him to give that man a cow, and told him that the poor man had no cow, that the hunters or something else had killed his cow, and entreated him to give him one of theirs. Her father told her that they could not spare one, and she entreated him to let him and his family come and live at his house and had much more talk of the same nature, whereby she manifested bowels of compassion to the poor. She has manifested great love to her minister, particularly when I returned from my long journey for my health the last fall, which we've already heard about. When she heard of it, she appeared very joyful at the news and told the children of it with an elevated voice as the most joyful tidings, repeating it over and over, Mr. Edwards has come home. Mr. Edwards has come home. Oops. She still continues very constant and secret prayer so far as can be observed, for she seems to have no desire that others should observe her when she retires, being a child of a reserved temper. Every night before she goes to bed, she will say her catechism and by no means miss. She never forgot it but once, and then after she was abed or in bed, thought of it and cried out in tears. I hadn't said my catechism and would not be quieted till her mother asked her the catechism as she lay in bed. She sometimes seems to be in doubt about the condition of her soul and when asked whether she thinks that she is prepared for death, speaks something doubtfully about it. At other times, she seems to have no doubt. But when asked, replies, yes, without hesitation. Well, that's uh, basically the end of, of that um, account of Phoebe Bartlett. I hope that you um, were surprised, as surprised about it as, as I was. Uh, that you could have a child in that condition. But one thing um, I should mention is that Jonathan Edwards believed that the conversion of really young children was, was a very rare thing and believed that most people who were converted were usually converted after they had grown a certain number of years, perhaps um, in early adulthood. Uh, but he was fairly convinced that um, <laughs> this little girl was converted, and I think you can see for the very obvious reasons because there was evidence of the Spirit of God at work in her heart. There was evidence of a genuine love for the Lord, a, a, a genuine love for her neighbors around her, that they also be saved 
from, uh, well, from destruction for their sins, concern for her brothers and or her brother and her sisters, uh, a concern for the poor, uh, a concern to honor the Lord on his Sabbaths, a concern to listen to the minister as he preached the word. Basically, she wasn't what you would consider a, a typical four-year-old, obviously. She wasn't just concerned about her toys and how many she had and how much fun she could have. And she wasn't like a lot of us in our culture today, just seeking after fun. But she was seeking the Lord. And I thought this would just be a, a wonderful illustration of really what we ought to be seeking after uh, in our own lives, that we might be revived. I mean, this is what it means to be not only converted, but revived, to be filled with the Spirit of God is to have our interests set on those things, the things above rather than the things of the world. So at this point, uh, why don't we turn the lights on, and uh, if you have any questions or any comments, uh, we'll go ahead and take those now. Okay. Yeah, actually, I, I, I didn't get the impression that, although Finney, I think, would probably be an emotional preacher, I didn't get the impression that the other, that the other speakers or other preachers were necessarily being overly emotional. I think, for instance, when you read um, what Edwards was like when he preached, uh, sometimes he, he was um, sort of characterized as, as a person who was just sort of a monotone droning. You know, uh, there wasn't much uh, emotion in what he was saying. But others would say that he spoke with a kind of seriousness and conviction that was so intense that you, you understood that he believed with his whole heart what he was preaching. But he wasn't going for the fireworks like, um, like what you had just described. I, I've seen uh, preachers do that. I watch, watched one guy uh, one time in a small church just basically go all over the building in his preaching. He was up on pews, sometimes up on the podium, you know, as far as uh, his just the gymnastics and gyrations. And as a matter of fact, we found it to be uh, very ineffective. Uh, we're kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> is he gonna pull us out or, or do something weird, you know? So, yeah, Greg?
think that would be um, uh, certainly, uh, that's certainly true. Um, Jonathan Edwards, by the way, as I, as I mentioned before, was very much a theologian of the heart, and he believed that, that really true religion resides in the affections, but he wouldn't call affections emotion, although it does create some emotion. And as Greg just pointed out, emotionalism could be perhaps more characteristic of what Finney was after as he tried to stir people up, get them scared to death so that they would come forward. But he did it probably more through um, manipulation than through the head to the heart, which is uh, certainly the way the, um, the Puritans would go about it. But they believed, and Edwards believed, that um, true Christian religion is all about love for the Lord. We need to love him. And you could see that was one element that was brought out in Phoebe Bartlett. Do you love the Lord? How much do you love him? Do you love him more than your sisters? Do you love him more than mom and dad? Yes, I love him more than anybody. And that's what the Lord tells us, that we have to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. By comparison to those closest to us, we need, actually need to, to hate them by comparison, not literally hate them. But um, Jesus did say, unless we come after him and hate our father and mother and so forth, and I don't think he meant by that literally hate them, but love him so much more. So we have to have right belief. We can't have true Christianity without it, but our heart has to be engaged in it as well. Any other uh, comments or questions? Did um, the children go? Yes, <laughs> Denise. Yeah, that might be kind of a hard thing to, uh, to nail down because, um, I mean, really, I'm not sure that I could give you a crisp definition right now of the difference between the two. Um, let's see, I, I know that one would be uh, more uncontrolled, and I think it would be like the, the idea of the emotions, whereas the other is a much more settled state of the heart. Perhaps it has to do with the transientness of the experience, you know, uh, it, do I feel like I've been... I mean, Edwards would point out, for instance, that, that sometimes people would, would read the Bible and would see the story of, of God sending his son to the world to save the world, and, and they'd be moved by that story in a way that they might be moved if they read a romantic novel. You know, it, it, the story itself kind of moves them, and he would see that as, as well, you know, the heart is affected, but it's kind of an emotionalism versus something that is a, of a changed nature, of a deep-seated love for the Lord that, that will continue, that goes beyond just the fact that I'm moved by this particular sacrifice that he's made, but I actually love him. Uh, maybe we can work on that uh, when we look at religious affections, because there actually Edwards defines what, what affections are as opposed to, um, and actually it, it does talk about it, um, maybe he talks about the depth and intensity of it. I actually spent some time in that book but it shouldn't be hard to, to figure out, and I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Greg? Is um, the emotions more to do with feelings and affections more to do with desires? Desires being more of a verb where feelings can come and go. Sounds like you'd be on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah? Certainly. Radically, yes. Sarah, did you have a question? Could you repeat that? I missed the first part. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, for revival to take place, it's not going to be just through prayer. We do have to use the means, but we can use the means and still not see revival because it's an actual sovereign act of God. Uh, the Lord has to purpose to do this. Um, yes, Denise? No, not really. Um, actually, we're, we're going to see next week the Great Awakening, which is a revival that took place just five years later and lasted for several years. This one, um, I, think he's, I think he said it was trailing off by, uh, it reached its apex in March and April. 
and I think he indicated that it was over within a year. But then there are revivals that took place after the Great Awakening as well. Some of them were man-made. We saw a little bit about that last week, but some of them were genuine. Uh, revival of New York, Welsh Revival. Um, there are revivals that people are saying are taking place in various places in the world. Uh, some of them are clearly not, um, such as the Toronto blessing, the you know, laughing in the spirit or whatever it may be. Um, but there may be some genuine works of God in other nations. I, I think it was not too long ago, perhaps even still in Korea, just hundreds of churches that are like hundreds of thousands of people uh, really earnestly seeking the Lord. Uh, one person once commented that uh, they were a little bit um, surprised uh, when they, they walked by one of the seminary classrooms, and I actually had that experience myself where there were a group of Koreans in there praying. And uh, because they were praying in, you know, in Korean language, it sounded like they were speaking in tongues. And at first, that's another group of people speaking in tongues, which they were from my perspective. But, um, but the earnestness with which they were seeking the Lord was, uh, was intense and something we're not used to hearing. Uh, so that's not something that's man-made. Certainly, it may go along with, with their genetics to some degree. Uh, you know, the, it's been pointed out that, for instance, uh, the Jewish culture is much more intense than we are, that's why they might tear their clothes where we might kind of sit there and, you know, not, not respond quite in the same way uh, that they do or throw dust and ashes on their head, uh, you know, or pull the hair out of their beards or whatever it may be. Uh, so some of that could be genetic, could be family traits, but uh, obviously when it comes to the Lord, it's, it's something that's also wrought by the Spirit of God. Yeah. Any other questions or comments?